you want me to do? Yes, uh, <laughs> Alright, so are you all Spring Arbor students? Okay, okay. Well, most of you probably not very darling as a professor here is Spring Arbor in the Communications Department. But something that you may not know is that she um, has co-authored two books with Tony Campolo. And one of those books that she will talk a lot about in this workshop today is called God of Intimacy in Action, which I had the pleasure of reading when I took a class with Mary called Con Spirituality in Action. Service. Service. Yeah, it's the same. I got the first two words right, though. Yeah, the, yeah. Very, the first workshop, I didn't remember what it was called. So, <laughs> yes, but, um, but, but within that class, we um, focus a lot on the issue of human trafficking. And, um, it spurred my passion of the whole justice movement. And um, now I'm a member of the Spring Arbor Human Trafficking Coalition. And that's why I get to be a part of this today and get to introduce speakers like Mary Darling. And, um, and her influence on this movement has been really great across campus, and she'll definitely tell you about that. Um, in this class, one of the practices that we would do every day was choosing a verse from the Bible, focusing on justice, and um, just meditating on that, thinking about that. And then we would talk about it as a class. And um, as a lot of you know, um, coming to this workshop, is that one of the hardest things in dealing with an issue like human trafficking is how to deal with that emotionally and spiritually. And Mary will be talking about that today. And so I just wanted to give you a little introduction. In the first workshop, I offered her that mug. But now it's not a surprise anymore. <laughs> she made a presentation <laughs> to me of the mug. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. And it has fair trade yeah, tea and chocolate in it. And you can purchase that tea and chocolate online at um, equalexchange.org. Mm -hmm. So, yes. <laughs> so anyways. This is Mary Darling. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Thanks, Enjoy. Rachel. Enjoy. Hope it goes well. Thank you. Before I tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm doing this workshop, I just wanted you to go around and say your name and why you're here. Hi, I'm Tim, and um, why I'm here is I'm just very interested in the issue of my I want to get more involved in this. Mm -hmm. And I did mean, you answered it the way I intended, I did mean not just at this workshop, but why are you here at this conference? No. Um, my name is Hannah, and I'm here because uh, human trafficking is just an act of passion in my heart since I was in Cambodia this summer, and, um, and she invited me. Great. Um, I'm Ashley Garrity. I'm here, um, I guess, like the first reason I'm here is because I have to go to community events for social work class I'm taking. Mm -hmm. Um, I chose this one specifically because just human trafficking and just injustices to people is just something that really sparks passion. Great, thank you. My name is Anna. Um, I guess I'm the only person here who does it to spring Um But I'm best friends with Kara, the ARDA, and I'm actually a criminology with focus on sex crimes major at my own school. Um, and so anti-trafficking has been something that I've been interested in and involved in for a while. This is my first time we get to go to a conference, so oh, I'm really nice. excited to be here. It's great. What, what school? Our Lady of Holy Cross College in New Orleans. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. great. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Tyler Redman. Um, I, uh, the reason why I'm here is just to learn a little bit more about um, human trafficking, and I'm a student of Jeremy Norwood for Modern Social Problems, and we get some extra credit, so <laughs> it's always a plus. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I came and uh, yeah, I, I'm really liking it. So far, and it's learning a lot of information. So I'm taking notes, and Sweet. yeah, I get to write a paper after that. So that's gonna be really good. So no, I'm not saying I'm just saying it's gonna help you know, me kind yeah. of think of everything. And, yeah. yeah. So I'm yeah, I'm excited. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, my name's Bob McCoy. First of all, I'm here for Africa and for no. Hey, I'm good. Also, there's another reason to be bad. Um, number two is um, okay. I believe that I call to be a missionary, mm -hmm. helping others, and this is one of the ways that I can use to help others. So I just want to learn more about just not about the end, but more of it. 
And then last week is also to get us on the track of DOT. We will support this or that. Yeah, everything. So yeah. I just want to see ways mm -hmm. that will help me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Can one of you tell the rest of how we, we do that? How, um, how you all support I, actually, this? We can piggyback. Uh, I mean, you know, Chris Conrad and uh, Peter Raimundo, um, they they grad they graduated last year. Mm -hmm. They were really involved with that. But years past, what they do is like for our conference meet, they would do um, we would get like a at lunch. Um, they would do like it's like a point or a scoring system or like you could get you could pledge how much money pledge. you did for yeah. every point you scored. Yeah. Kind of yeah, and then someone would like write down like fifty cents per point, and that's how much they would. They would have to pay if you got if you scored like a hundred something points, they'd have to pay like fifty cents per that point, and then that might go towards um, I don't know what we what we raised. I think either this conference. I think this okay. Conference. So the money that we raised for that went to this to help run this conference. So that's sweet. So yeah, Thank it's you. Really, yeah, yeah. And we wear and orange. We also wear these mm -hmm. like you know, wristband, and the, at the meet we wear like orange hand band, band or whatever because. Orange civilized freedom. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for telling us that. Yeah. Um, well, you're here at this particular workshop because something caught your attention with with the description. And and the thing is, you know, people are here at the workshop in general because there is something where their heart, you know, their heart is connected somehow. They've got some interest in this topic. And I am a huge fan. One of my very favorite verses in the Bible is Micah 6, 8. And so what does God require of you? And that's really interesting that it starts out that way. What does God require of you? But to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Now, what has happened historically, and we're not going to stay there, but I just want to frame this a little bit. What's happened historically is that we picked out parts of those verses in, in churches and bodies of believers, then we'll say, you know, we're more for that, what some people call, and in my tradition of Wesleyanism, the Free Methodist Church is Wesley tradition, but it's often called personal holiness. And Wesley also talked about social holiness, but we divided that out often. And to, to our detriment and to the detriment of the holistic gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, people are here today because they're interested in a topic that is really important, which is also a topic that Wesleyans are interested in because we have a history of being against slavery. But this is a difficult topic, and you've already heard some stories on how, you know, the heart-wrenching and all these injustices that can make you really angry. So, a little bit about my own journey, and don't be scared when I start it back in junior high. I'm not going to take that long to tell my own history, so I will fast forward after that. But when I was in junior high, there was this justice issue that I was really, I wanted to really get involved in. I saw this injustice, and, and I, I was thought, this is not fair, and I've always really had a heart for, you know, the underdog and what's not fair. And so I remember I went home, and I'm telling my mom, this is not fair, and this needs to change, and, and I was really angry about it. And my mom said to me, this was her response, not good for you, I love it when you're involved in issues, that's really important for us. Because my mom has always had a very deep faith, and she's always had a heart for those who live in poverty and oppression. That was not her response, though. Her response was, whoa, I'm glad you didn't grow up in Nazi Germany, because you'd be marching with the Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> and, and... I thought about that. It actually turned out to be a real, a real gift from my mom. She noticed something in me that was scary. My heart for justice was not coming out of love. My heart for justice was coming out of somewhere else. There was some real anger attached to it, and it wasn't righteous anger. I mean, it wasn't a justifiable anger. It was something where she sensed something not right in my spirit. And that is a real danger for people involved in justice issues. And so it's vitally important for a lot of reasons, it's vitally important that we stay fueled. And, and, and there's lots of reasons for that. We can, I talked only about anger so far, we could get very angry, we could get self-righteous, we could burn out. You know, this movement is described 
it won't take you very long to hear that, that analogy of we're in a marathon, not a sprint. You know, or you could look at it as we are, this is about, this is about crock pot living, not microwaving. You know, this is a long issue. This has you. We want people who have staying power. There are a lot of people who come in and out of this issue because things aren't happening fast enough. Jim Martin, who works with the International Justice Mission, has a great book, and it's called The Just Church. Have you read it? Yeah. Great book. And uh, he talks about, I don't know if you remember this, but he talks about a youth group leader calling him up one summer and saying we're going to take a, a trip with our youth group and can we go somewhere and do a rescue? And, and Jim Martin said, uh, no. And so, you know, they didn't realize everything that has to go into something like a rescue, which is part of, you know, we heard about that this morning with, one of, with uh, Jeremy, uh, with Johnny, uh, who works in Green Rapids. How you know there's this there was this rescue done that didn't go very well, and so you've got to do your homework, and so you have to have staying power for an issue like this. Now, my own involvement in this issue started about four years ago. I've always, like you, I told you, I've always had a heart for justice, but I was feeling called to get involved. I was involved in things that were somewhere else, and that's very important. But I was feeling a real call to be involved on a more local level right here in Jackson County. But there, is, there are so many good things really happening in Jackson County to, count, to try to counteract this issue and other important justice issues, so I wasn't sure what to do. That whole idea of trying to decide what to do, because there are so many things to do. You have better staying power if you make a good decision on that rather than just jumping into anything. And so I really felt like I, like, God was telling me, you need to pray and wait. And I'm not good at that, but I like to wait. So it was pray and wait, and I committed to pray and wait. It's really interesting when I look back on that now. I was praying and waiting because what was going to be revealed to me to be involved in had not yet happened. And so this is what happens. Uh, the pastor of our church across the street, Pastor Mark Van Dalen, his son, Andrew, went to Cambodia. Rachel went on the trip the year after, I believe the year after Rachel was the one who introduced me. So that, this will be Rachel right here. She, um, she went to Cambodia the year after Andrew Van Dalen did. Andrew went in a January and came back and talked to his dad about it. And his dad's heart was really gripped with this issue of trafficking that, that Andrew had encountered with Jeremy Norwood in Cambodia. Andrew's heart was broken. He came home, talked to his dad about it, and his dad uh, really, that gripped his heart. And so then in, Fe in February, his dad preaches a sermon on human trafficking and says, you know, we are from a Wesleyan tradition, uh, a, a tradition of wanting to abolish slavery, and I want this church to be a church that works, a, uh, works to abolish modern day slavery. And he said, I'm looking for a small group of people who will join me in that. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> it's, this hasn't happened very much in my life. It was one of those moments where I went, that is so clearly the answer to these prayers of the last six months. No doubt. My friend sitting across a, the sanctuary had the same exact thing happen at that time. And together, we, we partnered together and joined a small group of people at the church who have been working with this issue for the last three and a half years, uh, specifically with this issue. And we also have, uh, I was just telling Tim about this, we have a missional group, it's called Set Free, that meets Sunday mornings at the Free Methodist Church, a small group of us who meet every Sunday morning at 10:15 uh, during the Sunday school hour, and you would be welcome to join us. If you want to fly here and join us, <laughs> you're welcome. You're all welcome to join us with that, just to even come and see if it's something you might be interested in. So what I, what my fear then with people who get involved in this issue is they won't have the staying power. So how do we do that? And from a Christian perspective, and that is how I will be speaking, but different religions have different ways that they deal with this. I'll be talking about a prayer this morning that also has its, it, some very Jewish roots in it too that are wonderful. And so, uh, but we need that staying power. 
And so I like to describe it, the, the analogy I like to use is the analogy of the garden. That there is a, a beautiful old song, your grandparents might know it, and it is, it's, I come to the garden alone, it's called In the Garden. I come to the garden alone, and the verses, the chorus is, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. It's very inviting, it's very soothing, it's, yes, I want to, to have that relationship with Jesus in the garden. It's really interesting, there's a third verse to that. And the third verse is, I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. And so, and so that staying power comes from going into the garden and coming out of the garden and developing a rhythm of that in our lives and going in and out of the garden. What I want to talk about in the time that we have today is what does it what does it look like to be in the garden in terms of that staying power that helps prevent us from being coming burnt out or too angry or self righteous or fill in the blank. If nothing else, you'll become physically sick because we can't do it all. So we we also need the body. We need people with us to do this. That's why a lot of people who are involved in trafficking issues do not like the movie Taken. Because it's not a Lone Ranger kind of an issue. It's not one person going in and doing a rescue with a lot of violence. It uh, makes for great Hollywood pictures, but in reality that's not how it works. There's a lot that goes into something like that. And so how do we have that staying power? I would say that one of the most important prayers that you can do is what we call intercessory prayer, and that's praying for other people. But, but people who are believers know that. Most people know that. What I'm talking about today are ways to keep us fueled that, that were new to me probably 10, about 12 years ago now. They're, they weren't new at all. They were steeped in hundreds of years of, of church tradition. I either hadn't paid attention to them. I thought I had, for, I had never heard of them until I realized that, that I had read a book years ago by Richard Foster called Celebration of Discipline that talked about some of these prayers. I love that book, but I had forgotten he actually mentioned the prayers. So the prayers that I'm going to talk about this morning are ones that really have helped continue to fuel my, uh, to fuel me to do the work, to not get burnt out, but not just me. This has been the case for so many people. So people that I know, and, and historically people who have done the work that helps God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And so what I'm going to talk about are three prayers, and the first one is called the Prayer of Examine. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I have prayer cards that I'm going to give you on these that outline a method for each of these prayers. The first one is the Prayer of Examine. The second one is called Lectio Divina, and these are written on the cards, and that's Latin for holy or divine reading. Now, you might be familiar with these or not. And the third one is called Centering Prayer, and it's a prayer of quiet or stillness with God. And there are scripture verses that back every one of these prayers, but they were lost traditions in my tradition of Protestantism. And they come, a lot of these come from the Catholic Church, and we have lost these. And they're, they're, the mothers and fathers of our church pray these prayers. And they're beautiful, and they are, and, and again, they are, these are the ways that have helped so many people have that staying power. And it's, it's what I think it means in large part to walk humbly with God so that we can do justice. And that is what justice should flow out of. Our love for God then propels us in how we love others. And some of that love requires us to do justice on a, a systemic level. What are those structures of injustice that are in place? And as Christians, how are we called to fight those, to overcome those so that people can live in freedom? And so, what I would like to do is two things. I have, uh, one is that I I'm going to take you through a very brief, um, we're going to actually do these prayers together very briefly. So we won't do them the length that you know they're usually taught to be done, which isn't even that long, but we don't have the time to, to do that this, today. So we'll do a very brief example of these. I'll explain them just a little bit. 
And then I, so I want you to have an idea of what they're like and why people have thought for centuries that they're important. And then I also do this though, and the reason I'm also taking you through it is that you, you might be surprised that you are called at some point to also teach these to others. And so I think that it's important for us to be equipped with different, different ways to pray. Because again, we can be stuck in certain ways of praying because we just weren't taught the wide variety of ways that we can have intimacy with God that can fuel us to do God's work in the world. So the first one, and I, I named them for you, what they're historically called. But when you're talking to people, that's also a discernment is, you know, it's a judgment call to say, how am I going to talk about that with people? Because saying the prayer of examine could scare people. It doesn't really sound very inviting. So, you know, I, I think that's a judgment call too to know whether or not you're going to name them. I often call, and I've got both names on these cards, I often call the prayer of examine an awareness prayer because that's what it is. It's becoming more aware of when, what I say, when we walk with God and when we do not. And, and so I'll take it, I'll start with that one then. And I do have all these steps on the card, on these cards. And this, there's not just one right way, excuse me, there's not just one right way to do this. These prayers, <coughs> the, the method for the prayer examine, I got from Ignatius of Loyola. And he's been dead for several years, so I didn't know him personally. But he, uh, he's a Jesuit, and he, he, he developed methods for what he calls a prayer of examine because he thought it was so important in discerning when God, you know, when he was a, a when he was walking with God and when he was not. And that, so that, that discernment for him. It became a way to life to be in lifelong discernment of living with God and walking with God. He developed a method for that based on the verses mostly found in Psalms that talk about, you know, like search me, O God, and know my heart. Uh, <coughs> Lamentations, there's a verse. Lamentations 3.40 says, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Um, psalm says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. So there's another psalm that says, when I'm on my bed at night, uh, examine me, O Lord. And so Ignatius said, well, what does that look like? How could I do that? And what I think is really exciting is that, again, we're a Wesleyan tradition here, and John Wesley loved to read St. Ignatius, and he did the prayer examine regularly. Wesley practiced the prayer examine regularly. And so what it is is simply... Looking at those ways, it's, it's asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us when we walked with God and when we did not. It is a pattern of being able to do that in ways that will help us to do justice in the world. <clears throat> if we don't understand where our anger comes from, it can be really counterproductive. If we don't understand certain things, we can turn into people that we never intended to be, who burn out on issues we were intended to really help affect. So, <clears throat> I want to take us through the prayer of examine, I'll give you these cards at the end. I just ask you to sit there in, in, in silence while I, while I walk you through these. And I'm going to try to leave uh, some time at the end today in case you have any questions <coughs> or comments about these or any concerns about these. And if anything that I am talking about today makes you uncomfortable, I encourage you to sit in silence because we need to rest. People who are who love justice work and who want to do justice, who feel called to justice, are very action-oriented and they don't take the time often. That's a problem that we can have. I said that at the beginning, that we tend to divide into camps rather than saying, wait a minute, let's be part of communities that value all of this. Doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with God. We do all of this rather than separating out depending on which part we like. We're, at the, we're the body. We're the body of Christ. That's the analogy that St. That Paul uses. We are the body of Christ. And so what does that mean? It means that we, we, we each play our part, but that the whole body values the other parts instead of breaking those parts off. And you know what happens when you break off body parts. It just doesn't work as well. So I'm going to have you go through this. And again, please know we're doing a very condensed 
cliff note version of these prayers to just give us an idea of how they are, all right? So I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and, and bow your heads and, and get comfortable. And Ignatius also said that it's very important to start this prayer in a spirit of thanksgiving. So we're, we're, I'm going to ask you to do that. We'll only take uh, several seconds for each of these steps, but now I'll guide you through all of these steps. So go ahead and, and keep your, you know, your eyes closed and, and relax. Step one, prepare yourself by quietly focusing your attention on God. And then recall and thank God for several gifts of the day. The smell of rain, the smell of coffee, a smile from someone. You can be very specific in your thankfulness. So in the quietness of your heart and mind, thank God for specific things. Dear God, as I enter into this focused time with you, help me to remember what you want me to remember and notice what you want me to notice, including my motives, with thankfulness. Help me to be open to anything you want me to see and change so that I can more fully love you and others. In Jesus' name. So now you are going to review your morning by responding to two questions. Trusting the Spirit to bring to mind what God wants you to remember. First question. So take a few moments to focus on this. When did I live out of love and freedom? Or you could ask, when did I walk with God today? Ask the Spirit to bring to mind when you acted out of love. Paying attention to feelings such as generosity, compassion, joy, and hope so that you can recognize when you were drawn to living with what happens when God's Spirit is guiding you. Second question, when did I not live out of love and freedom in Christ? Or when did I not walk with God today? Ask God to reveal to you the events and patterns of the day that do not lead to love and freedom in Christ, such as anger, pride, jealousy, or anxiety. God, thank you for what you have shown to me today. Help me to accept with gratitude and grace all that you have revealed. Thank you for all the ways your love is already revealed in and through me. Give me strength and courage to change what needs to change and to ask others for forgiveness if that is what you want me to do. Thank you that you have my true heart's desire in mind. Work in me to always believe that so I can truly love and serve you and others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look up the prayer of examine, you'll see different ways, but they're all basically, they all basically boil down to the thankfulness and the, the, two, the two parts. Um, and so this is what I call a trust prayer. It's a formational prayer. It is, it is something that you do over and over. Ignatius taught his followers that if you 
forsake any prayer in the day, never forsake the prayer exam. And he thought it was that important to understand what it means to walk daily with God. And, you know, when we are trying to discern something, we will say, you know, I'm going to pray about this for a little bit. Like, then that's legit. Like when I said I prayed for those six months. But we, we don't only do that. Sometimes we really compartmentalize. Where you go, okay, I'm going to just live my life. And then, oh, now I have to really pray about this. But we're not being intentional with how we're inviting God into the ways that we daily live our lives. And that's what the prayer exam is doing so that you start to develop more of a sense of what to do on a regular basis, how to live on a regular basis. And I had a funny thing happen when I was talking about this prayer to students one time, encouraging them to do it. A student came back to me and said, and said, I found this as a great deterrent prayer. And I went, what? She said, it'll actually stop me from responding certain ways. Because now that I'm in a pattern of doing it, I think, oh no, that's gonna be that's gonna come up in that second part of the prayer, so I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> if I respond that way, I'm gonna feel bad. So I'm not gonna respond that way. So it actually helped her to be it did, it was a deterrent for her. And I never really thought of it that way until she told me that. But it will help us to discover patterns, and that is so important. Dallas Willard, who writes a lot about the spiritual practices, he was speaking on campus several years ago, and he said, you know, I really doubt Jesus went around and said, you know, what would Jesus do? WWJD, what would Jesus do? He said, because Jesus came from a life of learning and walking so closely to God that most of the time he knew what to do. And that's, that's, the, that's the fruit of something like the perfect example. Now, you might say Jesus had an unfair advantage. <laughs> okay, he's the son of God, you know, so is that really fair to say? But yes, because Philippians 2 says that he humbled himself and gave up all of that and came as a baby and came to live the life that he could, so he could be a model for us to imitate, which means that's doable. If we're supposed to imitate Christ, that means we have the power in us to do, through the Spirit, to do what Christ wants us to do. In Romans 12, Romans 12, 9 through 11, one of the parts of that, those verses, which those are great verses, and one of the parts of it is that is to, for us to always keep our zeal. And we are told, keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Well, another one, another version says zeal. That's what we're talking about today. How do we do that? How do you keep your zeal? Because we're told to keep it. And we have to be fueled with the spirit to do that and these these practices again have helped so many people over the years to stay fuel the second one is let's hear the vena and that is i often will call that a reflection prayer we are reflecting on scripture and so what we do there is we we've been and let's hear the vena in that in reflecting on scripture we should pick a wide variety of scriptures over time to reflect on when i speak to groups who are, are really into what, what Wesley called the personal holiness, I have to encourage those groups often to remember to also pray and reflect on justice verses. Because they tend to pray and reflect on what I call just Jesus in me verses. But there are so many justice verses and great justice passages like all of Micah 6, 8, Matthew 25, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 58, all of those are such wonderful justice passages that we don't always focus on. I mean, you, you can hear so many people, so many Christians who, who now have a heart for justice. I've heard this so many times that they will tell you, where were all these verses? I read the Bible. How did I miss these? It's because we weren't ta taught to focus. We were taught to only focus on certain verses and not others. And we need to look at the totality of Scripture. So I, and then for those people who are very much into justice issues, I will also, I will often tell them that they need, you know, don't forget to do Lectio Divina on the verses where Jesus, Jesus invites you to rest. And so because you're here at a justice conference, I am going to have us do Lectio Divina on one of those verses where we're more quiet. Uh, and it's more about setting us apart with God. So, okay. Uh, this one, the, it's one of my favorite verses to talk about. And um, 
it is one that we hear at funerals, but it should be used a lot more than just funerals. And it's Psalm 23, 1 through 4. So what I would like you to do is to just close your eyes and rest while I read these. And I will read it once. Oftentimes in Lectio Divina, people that's been taught that you read it twice slowly. I'm going to read it once slowly, and I'm going to then invite you to sit with it. We'll only do that for about a minute. And you will sit there and don't work with, don't try to analyze it. Sit quietly with it and trust the spirit to lift off something. How I like to say this, what lifts off, you know, the page if you're reading it. But what comes to your heart and mind from this. But don't try too hard. If nothing comes, that's fine. But if something does, that's fine too. So I will, so what I'll do right now is read it slowly. And then we'll, we'll be in a time, about a minute of silence, and then I'll read it again to close that time. So go ahead and close your eyes. Psalm 23, 1 through 4. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 23, 1 through 4. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. That's a, a short version. You can do that for a long time, for a short amount of time. Uh, people who teach Lectio Divina, someone I highly respect who's a monk, <laughs> says that you can, you know, he recommends you do this 10 minutes a day. I just thought a monk would say longer than that. <laughs> but 10 minutes a day. I, you know, you can do it for a couple minutes. And I think it's very valuable what, you know, I, I like to describe a lot of these these more, you know, intimate practices with God as just the, a way, not just, but that it's God's spirit working deep in our spirits. And that's especially true of the one, the last one I'm going to talk about. But before I do that, the Matsu Divino, when you do what we just did, the, you can do this in groups. You can journal, first of all, if you do this by yourself, you can journal. And I would, I would if you do journal, you can do that with the prayer of exam, and I did this for a while, a very intentional time with the prayer of exam, where I journaled, and then I would look back, and it was amazing the patterns I saw that I would have forgotten if I hadn't written it. But I'm not, I'm not one who naturally journals. My sister journals every single day about everything. I mean, she can tell you what we did a year ago or what she did a year ago, and but I, I don't that's not something that comes naturally to me or that I'm drawn to but I found great benefit from that with looking at discovering patterns and it's the same thing with Lectio Divina you can also do this in groups I've done this in groups where we share we, we will this is what Rachel was talking about we would do this at the beginning of our class where it, with the Just Church they have he has a bunch of verses that he's compiled at the back of it and I would have them pick a verse and they would do, they would reflect on it for a few minutes and then we would share. And I, I never, this is just how I believe this, I never require someone to share. And so I think that forces them while they're 
engaging in reflection. It forces them to try to think of something they can share, and I don't want that to be pressure. So if you're ever doing this with a group of people, I would not tell people where everybody's going to go around and share. I would just invite people to share if they want, and if they don't, that's fine. And so that's up to them. So that the next and final prayer that we'll talk about is centering prayer. Centering prayer, actually I'm talking about it as an ancient prayer practice, but the term centering prayer was not coined until the 1970s. And it was coined because of, it was coined by people who, who really believe something that Trappist monk Thomas Merton said. He said that he believes that we have lost, in this day and age, we have lost the ability to enter into the kinds of deep silence and deep stillness with God that the mothers and fathers of our church were able to do, that fueled them to do God's work in the world. But he said, we have too much coming at us these days, and we're no longer able to enter into that kind. We've lost the ability to enter into that kind of deep stillness. Thomas Merton died in the 60s. Imagine what he would say today. I mean, he died before cell phones and computers. And so with everything coming at us today, what would he say to us today? So Sunday prayer was coined as a way for us to get back into that kind of stillness. It was a method to encourage us to do that. And, you know, I come from a Methodist background, so I like method. John Wesley liked method. Ignatius liked method. And so this is a method. Again, these steps I'm giving you are steps that what, that I've compiled from what I know of these, but there are different people will come will teach them a little bit differently. They have all got the same essence to them. Center in prayer is, is simply a way to sit in silence with God, but we can struggle with that, especially those people who are doers, who want to do justice. It's like, oh, what good does it do to just sit here? It does a lot of good. It does a lot of good. You can't just rush into justice work and you won't be sustained in justice work if you don't take time to rest and and those of us who are in sports know that you have to take time you can't you can't work out all the time you have to allow your body to rest we have sleep what happens if you never sleep we know what happens we're not good for much when we don't sleep okay so that's that's built into the rhythm of the way that god created us to set apart time. It's a whole idea of Sabbath, to set apart time. Because we are unable to enter into those kinds of silence, Centering Prayer teaches us to choose a word that helps us bring back us back. That makes some people nervous. It, 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 it sounds like, wait, is this some other kind of religion? Some people have problems with that, some don't. But for those who do, I, I, you know, I and others say, this is only a way to bring us back. You can say that with Jesus. As with Jesus, help me to focus back on you. It's, uh, it's only a way if you get distracted, and if you're normal, you will be distracted. And so Henry Nowen, who writes a lot about spiritual practices and spent a lot of time alone, he said that when he, when he has time alone with God, he feels like he has a, a banana tree in his head with monkeys jumping up and down. And I was so thankful to read that from someone who spends a lot of time in silence. I went, thank you. I needed to hear that because... Distractions are a real problem for me, and that's one of the reasons that I need this prayer. I have fought this prayer. I have been drawn to it. It's been the hardest one for me. It's been the one that has changed me the most. Recently, I was talking to a student who said, I feel called to silence with God to this, you know, to what you call centering. But she said, I'm really struggling with it. So I think maybe, do you think maybe I'm not called to do that? And I said, no, I think that's exactly, I did let there be a few seconds there before I responded, but I said, no, I actually think that's why you are called, because you need to quiet yourself enough to hear from God. And we can be so busy and so distracted. And this is, this is about discipline. This is about training ourselves. This is about, you know, we call them spiritual disciplines. And the reason for that is that we need to train so Paul talks about, he talks about that a lot, he uses the analogy of training for a race. You don't just show up, you have to train. And so that's, that's what these practices are intended to help us do. They're ways that we, what Henry Nolan says, these are ways for us to create space, for us to meet God and God to meet us. Can God meet us anywhere? Yes. But the Bible also says that we can quench the spirit. And we can stop ourselves from hearing. What we need to hear 
because the issue that we're talking about here, there are people suffering and they need us. And they need us to set aside time to be fueled so that we can help them in the best way possible. So what I want us to do just for a couple minutes is to be in that kind of silence. Don't fear if you happen to fall asleep, okay? Because I, that does happen sometimes when people really enter into centering prayer. People have asked me that. They say, what happens if I fall asleep during this prayer? I have two responses. The first one is, what a wonderful way to fall asleep. You know, just quieting our hearts and minds. But if you fall asleep all the time, every single time you do it, then either you need to pick a different time of day, or you need to get more sleep. And I'm serious about that, but it's a real practical thing. We might not be getting enough sleep if that happens to us regularly. If it happens today, don't worry about it. We will wake you up. And we're only doing it for a couple minutes. It's actually taught to do twice a day for 20 minutes. I teach it to do, I teach people to do it 10 to 20 minutes a day. So, but you will find great benefits from quieting yourself in God's presence in this way. So what we're going to do is, and if you want to, I would just say right now, if you get distracted, just say Jesus, or say be still. I like that, be still. It's a, you know, it's, it doesn't say be still if you want to. It's like a command in the psalm. Be still and know that I am God. Wait upon the Lord. So that's it. That one's, this one's simple. It's the simplest one to talk about. It's the simplest one to teach. It's the hardest one to do for most people that I talk to, okay? Some people love it, but I just struggle with it. And that's because I, I want to do. I like checking things off my list. As a matter of fact, during silence one time, I did my whole Christmas list. And I went, oh, I can't believe I got through my whole list without realizing I'd gotten distracted. My spiritual director, I am like a spiritual mentor, he, he said, just keep showing up. Don't get down on yourself. And I found out that's how people teach this prayer. Do not get down on yourself. Just come back to the silence when you catch yourself and just show up again the next day. So we're only going to take about a minute right now and I'm going to ask you to, to close your eyes, to get comfortable and do stay in your seats and get comfortable. And I want you to make sure that you're breathing more slowly, that you're relaxing in God's presence. One of the images that I heard for this is of a baby resting on a mom or a dad's chest. The baby isn't doing anything but just resting. Gregory the Great, one of the fathers of our church, calls this prayer deep resting in God. So I love that image of the baby. Because you, Some people say, what are we supposed to be doing? Nothing. You're supposed to be resting. You're not supposed to be trying to hear from God. You're supposed to be resting in God's presence. So let's go ahead and rest in God's presence. And if you get distracted, just come back, okay? And I will say amen at the end of this time. Now what we've done is just a, you know, I've said this, but it's a sampling of these prayers that have helped so many people to have that staying power, to be fueled. When I was first really interested, you know, it's, I told you I come from a history of being very uh, 
my heart being gripped by justice issues. And, and so when I was first interested, I, was, I would look for books that combined both. And what was interesting was, um, there were books out there, and there is a book that is called like Spirituality and Justice, and so about 25 years ago, there were, there were books on spirituality and justice, but the problem was that the books written by Christians on spirituality and justice at that time would assume the spirituality part. So what I mean by that is, so if you're a Christian, this is why you're called to do justice, which is a great message that some people had forgotten. You know that that's part of the holistic gospel, but the problem was they would just they would say you're a Christian, so this is what you do, but didn't talk about how to sustain that. But what does that mean? How do you sustain that? The good news is that there are books being written like that now, and the Just Church is one of them. That Jim Martin talks he will he ha, he talks about the prayer of examine. So he Jim Martin works with International Justice Mission talks about the prayer of exam in his book, The Just Church. And he spoke in the area last February. And he, he said, he was talking to a group of people, and he said, when you work for International Justice Mission, you're told in the interview process that you have to be willing to commit to, when you've come to work in the morning, I think he said from 8.30 to 9, you have to be in silence. And somebody raised their hand and said, what if somebody says they don't? They got more comfortable with that. And he said, we tell them they won't be comfortable working for us. And so that it's, it's not a good fit because that's part of our culture, that you need to be feeling yourself. He's very much, he very much believes in, in that, you have to, that you have to feel yourself for the staying power that it takes to do the difficult work of justice. There's another really great book by a co-authored by Chris Rock, and not the Chris Rock you might know, but you probably don't know this Chris Rock. Chris with a K. Chris Rock and Joel Van Dyke. Chris Rock and Joel Van Dyke called Geography of Grace. And they also talk about the importance of spiritual practices and fueling us to do the, the, the hard work of justice. The, Joel Van Dyke is a friend of mine, and he works in Guatemala with some very difficult situations with gangs and prisons, and, and he firmly believes in the spiritual practices, taking that time, what, what gets us to you know, show up and, and spend time with God in the garden. He firmly believes and talks about in that book this is kind of some of the practices we've talked about today. These are people who are on the ground floor of doing some really difficult justice work, who have found, know the value of going into the garden to be able to do God's work outside of the garden. Another analogy that I love, and I'll close with this, is the analogy of breathing. You can't just breathe in. You can't just be in the garden. It's two sides of one coin. You have to breathe out. And the rhythm of our relationship with God and doing God's work in the world is that breathing in and out. You won't last long. You won't live long if you only breathe in. And you won't be effective for God's work in the world if you don't, if you don't establish that rhythm of breathing out, in and out, going in and out of the garden as part of your daily life. So I encourage you uh, to commit to what that means for you, to you know, to see what grips your heart with what we've talked about today. And if and as I pass out these cards, if any of you are interested in ever using these in the future in any capacity, I have these in a document that I would just send to you in a document that's ready to print. So if you were ever involved in a group where you wanted to use these for anything or just use one of them, please let me know. I, uh, people have asked me if, I'm, if I want to share these, and I'm very willing to share my document here if you ever want more copies of this. Or if you want more information, let me know. My email is mdarling at arbor.edu. Mary.darling also works. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Let's see, we've got about five minutes. There you go. And so does anybody have any questions? Oh, thank you. <laughs> any questions or comments? Anything? When you're doing the scenario prayer, uh -huh. 
is it okay if you like visualize something or are you aiming for like complete silence of mind? We really are aiming for complete silence. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is the aim. But I would also say that, you know, I that's what centering prayer is, but if, but if you want to that's the that's the purpose of centering prayer. And that's a really a really great question. It's an important question for this prayer. Now, if you want to just spend some time with God and hear from God, you know, you can just sit in silence and if something comes to you. But in classic centering prayer, for the purpose of, of you know, you know, being still so that you can have God's spirit work deep in your spirit, the point is to not do that. But I also don't want to discourage people from, you know, if they just want to sit with God and say, okay, this is what's coming to me. And with Le- and I'm going to expand that with Letzio Divina. There, I, t- I said if a word comes to you, for some people that's an image, and that's really appropriate for Letzio Divina. You know, some people get really active with that, and they, scenes come to them. I, and they can be just beautiful. But the, the purpose of actual centering prayer is the second thing of what you said, not to go for the image. <clears throat> and some people disagree with that because it's like, how could it be wrong to do that? And it's not really right or wrong thing. It's the intent of centering. Yeah, that's the, just not. That's more of listening prayer. That's just exactly, exactly. Yes. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you so much for coming.